This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Dave McDonald. Joining us this week is New Orleans-based composer, or I guess you're in Louisiana Monroe now, right? Shreveport, actually. Shreveport. Uh, so Shreveport, Louisiana-based composer. All over the state. Philip Bradbury. He's been all over the state of Louisiana. Uh, and we're so glad that he can join us today. Um, he's relatively early in his career, but he's got a really interesting project that we'd like to talk to him about. And the cool thing is that... Uh, he likes to play around with things other than dots and lines on the page. So, Philip, thank you for joining us this morning. We're really glad to have you. Thanks. It's great to be here. Um, so, the 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 first time that I, I saw any of your um, posts on the Society of Composers listserv, SCI listserv, was when you were telling everybody about this project that you have <laughs> going on called The Way of the Sax. So, I don't want to describe anything incorrectly so i'm going to let you tell us what the way of the sax is and how this idea came to be well way of the sax as succinctly as possible is an integra interactive graphic novel um it will have game type elements it'll have multiple endings optional scenes, hidden items uh, you can click on and read more about the background of the story. And there will be a few mini-games. And uh, it is a comic, but there will be some motion within each panel, and there will be an original music soundtrack composed by myself. So what I think is interesting, we were talking about this a little before the show, uh, on Sound Ocean TV, we have this show that usually is covering concert music, and then we have another show, Streamers and Punches, that normally covers film music. And I was saying that ordinarily, I think, when, when, when I think about uh, music for video games, which is basically what this is, um, it's, uh, I, I associate that more closely with film music. And the thing that I think makes it interesting for us to discuss on this particular show is that you are a composer who is kind of building the 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 game environment around your music um so tell us about the story though that that you have for for way of the sax this is all done yeah. through flash too right no actually it's done in html5 okay there's a pro Hooray there's web standards a program called Construct 2 uh, co codes entirely in HTML5, and you enter events, and it uses logic instead of actual coding. The program codes everything, but I enter all the events myself. So you're you're basically building this from the ground up, and the way of the sax is actually about a saxophone player, right? There's there's a saxophone player that's central to this story. Yes, uh, Ken Suto is the main character. He's half Japanese, half American. He comes from a, a pretty jaded past. And basically, he's a martial artist slash saxophone player. Jazz saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets in a lot of trouble. <laughs> okay. So I love the idea of the superhero slash saxophonist. Right? It's this, this, I, and not that he has superpowers. Does he have superpowers? No. Okay, but you know, you know what I mean, like the the preternaturally gifted uh, protagonist uh, is a saxophonist. That's very cool. Um, so, where did this idea come from, and w how did you decide that you wanted to apply it not to um, more traditional narrative concert music structures, and instead apply it to um, something that was interactive and something that was on the web? That's a hard question. Um, and it seems like the medium I, is much easier. On yeah, the well, I've always wanted to uh, do a, a neat project, and it, it's hard to find something that is just for you. It's just for me. I mean, and I I, I uh, grew up reading lots of comics, and I grew up playing lots of video games, and I grew up writing music. So I, I guess it just kind of clicked in my head. Just put it all together. 
And I've always been a creative writer, and I just... This story came to me somehow. I don't know. I'm a saxophonist. I, I play jazz saxophone as well. So, I guess I will relate to that character. I, I think yeah. this is something we're seeing more and more of, is composers becoming uh, less specialized. Composers taking on these other roles that were traditionally reserved for other specialists. So, you're not only writing the music, but you're also creating the the game environment uh, and you're creating the story itself. So you're you're writing a, a story that goes with this. And I think that's a really interesting thing. Um, something that I think is becoming really more a lot more common in part because of the technology that allows you to make these things. So you're not, you know, coding assembly or anything to make this happen you're using this higher level structure uh to to make this happen but you're making something unique with it let's not say jack of all trades master of none well of course not <laughs> <clears throat> it's the wave of the future it's, it's right um philip i see that uh you're collaborating with the uh artist dave uh gardner is he he's dr doing the drawings that's correct Yes. So did you seek him out as, as a way to do this project, or did you know him and that was part of the genesis of the project? I, or? I had in an in a artist in mind originally, but he's uh, actually very busy. He's an assistant editor at Dark Horse Comics. So he, oh, wow. But um, I put an ad out on the internet on all sorts of sites, Game Dev, DeviantArt, uh, Freelance.com, and just to see who I could find, who would hit me back. And Dave Garner seemed like the right choice. Mm -hmm. So nice. t tell, us about, tell us about how that interaction is going then. Between me and him? Yeah. Oh, well, it's, um, I'd say it's pretty good. He, uh, it, this is a new project. I mean, it's, it's not really unprecedented, but we're, we're making stuff up as we go along. So he has to understand that, and he's been very patient so far, and we've already uh, gotten some stuff entered into the program that he's drawn. And I think uh, as he sees what what uh, I can do with it, what the program can do with it, I think it motivates him to... Uh, I think it'll keep motivating him to be really interested in the project. So he doesn't have any experience with this interactive platform either. This is something no. that you're bringing to the collaboration. Right. He uh, He's a digital artist, and he deals with you know Photoshop and Dreamweaver and whatever else programs, art, uh, graphic artists and digital artists. So, um, <clears throat> but you guys are sort of like learning technique right now, figuring out what you can do together using these two things and, and the ways you can control the content and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Um, just in the last couple of weeks, I've figured out how to uh, do kind of like stop motion animation by frame by frame. And, and what, what Dave has to do is take one panel, change it slightly and it makes it like animated. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's and what animation is, right? And it's it's not it's not full animation because it's a, it's a comic, right? But you can have still images, uh, zoom in and zoom out, or move across the screen. Hmm. So now, go, go ahead. ahead I was go gonna ahead. I was just gonna ask if if you know of any other projects like this, these kind of interactive media projects that have been taken on by composers where music is such a central focus. I've seen a lot of projects like this that are video games or kind of borderline between video games and just kind of like a choose your own adventure story kind of thing. But where the, the artwork is the focus where the, the illustrator has conceived of this project and there's an, an interesting uh, through line in, in, in the art. But I, I don't know of any projects like this that have been instigated by a composer. Do you know of any Philip? I know there um there are a couple at least one or two projects that are similar to mine that I've found out, so I guess they're my competition. <laughs> but, I, uh, I wouldn't say competition. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we can all we can all win. Yeah, as a saxophonist. 
I think he well, can beat anyone else up. This other one is about the CIA and CIA operations. Interesting. And, it, and it's music focused? I would say it's, it's more artwork focused. Okay. But it does have some really good background music. And I've talked to the guy who's in charge of it and complimented him on it. Great. Hey. Do you have a do you have a timeline in mind for this project, or are you still kind of just feeling out how this collaboration is going to work? Kind of both. I was hoping to get the demo completed by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. uh, project's becoming pretty massive, pretty fast. Mm -hmm. That happens. And I, so, I, I, I still want to deliver. Yeah, of course. Um, and and you have set up a Kickstarter where people can help support you. Um, this is to is this to pay the artist for his time? It, it's mostly to do that. I've guaranteed him a, a sum of money, and I want to pay him that. And then mm -hmm. I guaranteed him a percentage of some of the uh, later stuff. And well, so uh, if you'd like, if you'd like, I, I anyone want, can go I don't over want to the Kickstarter page. Free on this. Right. right. We're, we're done doing it for free. We're done doing it for the experience. That's right. <laughs> there's a, there's the software, I've had to pay for the license for that. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, people should know you can go on over to Kickstarter and support the project, and there are two out of three spots left for the maximum okay. pledge. I mean, I'm sure. What's that? There's one now. Yep. Oh, okay. The, <laughs> the site is not up to date, I guess. Yeah. So As of this morning, there's one spot... Uh, oh that, wow! I just hit refresh <laughs> on that because I've had that tab open all morning. Yeah. Cool. Guess, so guess who's going to be an extra in in your new project? <laughs> That's right. So, uh, oh, Nate Blyton. Hey. Uh, okay. Well done, Nate Blyton. <laughs> that is awesome. This is such a cool project, and you know, you, I've never you, done voice acting. So hold on, I, I'd take it on. It'd be good. You should have the whole Sound Notion crew be in this. <laughs> well, I, I I didn't get a chance to, just to make it clear what we're talking about here. For the maximum pledge amount of fifty dollars, you get to have a. This is not one of these Kickstarter projects where the maximum pledge is like fifty thousand dollars. Right. Um. You get to you get a cameo in the finished product. So our very own Nate Blyton. Let's see Nate Blyton. Yes. Nate Nate strike a pose. Ready. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Everybody chain. screen cap that or, and uh, oh, do something oh. creative with it. Get your Photoshop on. Oh, yeah, uh, right. that's going to be awesome. But even, if, even if you don't have $50 to pledge, you can still only pledge $1 if you wanted to. That's true. And it's certainly a project worth worth supporting. And so we wanted to, we're, we're glad, Philip, you were able to, to make the time to come talk to us about it. This sounds like a very cool project. How is the music coming along for it? And I'm curious to know. Um, what how you're thinking of the relationship between the music and the other parts because i know you're a composer and a lot of times in both film and video games um the the music is more of an afterthought um the 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 whole thing is constructed for example in a film the whole thing is constructed the final cut is essentially well final uh before the composer is is actually producing sounds um in a lot of cases and I assume that's not going to be the case for you because you're going to be thinking about the music as you go along. So what, how do you think of that relationship between those two ideas? Well, um, when, I, when I wrote the story, I could hear some of the music in my head. Not, not no, obviously, but I kind of knew what style I wanted at the time. Uh, when Ken's playing a jazz solo, uh, that's going to be a jazz solo. The notes aren't written, but the style is there. It's just all in getting the notes down and getting the timing correct. The advantage I have is that I'm I'm the one creating what's going on in the program, so I can tell the program to wait however long I want it to to finish the music. What and program is this, by the way? It's called Construct 2 by uh, Sierra. Uh, great. Ah, Sierra. That's Sierra. Sierra, makers of fine adventure games from the 1980s and 90s. 
Mm-hmm. King's Quest and uh, <laughs> Leisure Suit Larry, which also just successfully completed a Kickstarter project Leisure Suit Larry did to uh, remake Leisure Suit Larry for modern platforms, if, if you ever were into that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, so you're recording live. You're playing the saxophone and making recordings here. This is not going to be digital performances, right? Well, a lot of it will be. Okay. I, I, I can't play an orchestra. <laughs> but Why not? Saxoph- What's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, when there's a saxophone part, a saxophone solo, that will be me. Right. And if there's other instruments, clarinet, I play clarinet too. Uh, I'll probably throw in some other stuff. I'm also making the sound effects myself or mm-hmm. finding good free commercial, commercial free uh, sound effects and modifying them to fit the comic. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this is the kind of thing I think that composers should be exposed to this idea of of a multimedia project, you know, executing something like this is something composers should be exposed to more and more um, because elements of you sound. Mean in, a, in their education. Yeah, in their in their education. Just thinking element in elements of sound design and, and linking that in some kind of meaningful way with visual elements where at least – you know, even if you're not the principal person uh, who's in charge of the visual part, you're working closely with someone who is, so you get your feet wet at least about how that might work, you know? And I don't think there's any emphasis in most programs on that. And and also, and I've spent time doing a survey, sort of, if you look up, like, multimedia degrees that can be gotten, you'll hardly ever find them, or, or interdisciplinary arts or anything like that. They never talk about music. They can't figure out how to put music because the way it's taught is sort of a closed off, you know, trade school environment. They can't figure out how to make it work with other art forms very well often. Yeah. Um, Philip, I, I have a question for you. Um, okay. When you so you you compose, you perform at, on on this variety of instruments, and then you also uh, you're a writer, and you seem to have a certain technical ability with uh, computers and different things. But I, I noticed on your website that you've got a bunch of different classical works and works for uh, jazz orchestra and things like that. Yeah. When you're doing all these uh, these other classical or like strictly musical projects, do you ever find yourself uh, coming up with a sense of narrative, like in the storytelling kind of thing, as you're doing it? Or. Um, I guess. Uh... For the most part, no. There's um, there's usually an idea or a concept that mm-hmm. I'm writing for. An extra musical concept, something outside the the, the music. Uh, not necessarily. I um, it, it could be like I I wrote a piano sonata based on uh grim fairy tales. Each movement is a, is based on a different fairy tale. Mm-hmm. You have Hansel and Gretel, Rumpelstiltskin, Sleeping Beauty, and Red Riding Hood. And I wrote what I felt would be appropriate for each uh, story. But then there's other pieces like like a big jazz band piece. Mm-hmm. It's just for fun. You know? mm-hmm. Just to play, just to write. And mm-hmm. then there's uh, my latest uh, my latest large project before this one. For the comic was a, a win ensemble piece about the retirement of the NASA space shuttles. Which I think that's that's a really cool subject to write a piece about. By the way, when I read that, I thought, oh, <laughs> that 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 deserves a piece. That's, of I was gonna say that's, wor- that's worthy. What does yeah. that sound like? What's that? What does that sound like? The retirement of the space shuttles. Uh well. <laughs> each movement kind of is, tell you. each movement is written for a space shuttle. There is actually six of them. I don't know mm. if, ever, if a lot of people know that, but the first shuttle was actually called Enterprise, and yep. it was ultimately named after the Star Trek Enterprise. That was the test oh. shuttle, right? Yeah, it was the test shuttle, right? Just for uh, to test the landing sequences. It never made it into orbit. That's uh, very cool. But that sounds. Kind of like Star Trek because I wanted to make it an homage, just that one movement. But the other movements, like Discovery, is very adventurous and uh, seafaring. Like da 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 da. 
then Challenger, which was Tragedy. Uh, it's a very it's a slow song uh, in honor of those who died. Right. And there's Atlantis, which is a, it's a mystery. Atlantis, the sunken city of Atlantis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's but a really great subject matter. And so that, you- that was, it's a very, very fantastical uh, movie. And there's Columbia, which uh, I wanted to get away from melody and harmony for the most part for that movement. And kind of live in the moment of what was going on in the shuttle as they were uh, approaching re-entry and approaching Earth after re-entry. And so that's, I incorporate the entire band is uh, some percussion into it. Every mm-hmm. band member is a percussionist. <laughs> and they, uh, they tap on their lap, they, uh, they clap, they stomp on the floor. And it becomes very intense. Very cool. Do you have a recording of that on your site? Uh, maybe. I, I don't have a live recording yet because uh, it's being performed later this year. Oh, cool. It, it, is, it is on some site somewhere as a, a very good MIDI uh, rendering. All right. Well, we'll we'll, we'll we'll definitely uh, look forward to to hearing that. Um, it's called it's called the world uh, in my window, the world in my window. So if you can put that in quotes on the internet, it's it'll pop up somewhere. Okay. Cool. cool. I get it. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> the world in my window. Uh, well, Sam, tell us something else about Star Trek. Well, no, no, no. Well, that's for later. Um, uh oh. <laughs> can't you can't skip ahead. It's interesting, Philip. It's been a while for Patrick. Uh, no, the <laughs> show works. One of the things you're accomplishing with this piece is um, because it's going to have interactive qualities, um, it gets away from the one sided digital experience, you know, where you turn it on and you watch it. So it's basically like TV. So you've changed it from that to something um, that, that helps fight the one sided nature of this kind of presentation. And do you know who else is doing that in education? Oh dear! <laughs> Artist Works. Um, uh. Artist Works. Artist Works is a is a uh, an online learning resource, sort of like an online school. They you pay tuition and um, take lessons, and uh, they have what they call the uh, video exchange, which is their way of solving the one sided um, nature of of uh, online learning, where. You upload a video. You have to use a webcam, so you, you know, practice your arpeggios on the guitar, and you videotape yourself, and then you upload a video, and then a, one of the resident artists actually reviews it and records a response video with demonstrations and talking about, you know, whatever it is you're having a problem with. Um, so that they've been around for a while, and it's a really interesting interface, and now they're offering classical music lessons um, for... Uh, they have five core... Orchestral instruments. They have uh, flute, trumpet, clarinet, 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 violin, and French horn. And then they also have classical piano and classical guitar. Yes. And they're being taught by some some heavyweights. Yeah. I don't know the other people as well, but I can tell you that the world of clarinet geekdom would be happy that Ricardo Morales is the clarinetist that they're using. Yeah. So they've got got, uh, principal players from the Philadelphia Orchestra. who were probably just looking for something to do when this was all going on. Um, and uh, Pittsburgh and Los Angeles, like like big, big uh, players from big orchestras are, are participating in this, which is really interesting to see. Um, I'm a little concerned about the what seems to be the asynchronous nature of these uh, quote-unquote lessons. Because, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, you make the video and then you upload it and then you get another like video response from the teacher, and I don't know how long that lag time is, but I'm sure it's not instant. Um, and I I would be concerned with that, and also I would be concerned with the ability of a student to, you know, adequately capture what they're doing with the audio and video technology that they have on their laptop. You know. Yeah. Well, like I was thinking point out, though that th- this sort of thing isn't isn't brand new or anything it's been going on since um i think 
2008. Man, man, well, Manhattan School of Music has a program, video conferencing lesson program, that was really spearheaded by um, Pika Zuckerman, um, the violinist, fieldist, and conductor. And I think that started like over a decade ago. So, um, and it's still going on today. So, it's that kind of thing is pretty successful. But Dave, mm-hmm. I share your your Dipticism? concern about something like lag time or or even getting to know the real sound of the instrument. Something yeah, like that. I mean, I, I'm a trumpet player, and I remember when I was first trying to record myself, it took me a long time to figure out how to make a recording of me playing trumpet that didn't sound terrible, because in a small, like in a practice room, a trumpet makes a lot of noise, <laughs> and mm-hmm. it takes it takes a lot to not, you know, kill a microphone in a, in a in a small room with uh, and with most of these instruments i would think mm-hmm. i was thinking that that a way to combat that or i was hoping that they have something sort of like uh i don't know like a concierge service or you know have a a setup specialist that helps you get started when you're first going to start doing it that maybe like could just be on a web chat with you talking about your setup and how you're going to make this happen you know I because know. i hate to see in, in, in an interface that has potential for learning but is limited in so many ways, I would hate to see time wasted on the instructor telling them, you know, try moving your mic here, try moving your mic here, do you have a short in that XLR cable, et cetera, et cetera. Also, I mean, I would be concerned with what they're seeing. With, with some of these more physical instruments like violin and, and piano and classical guitar are on here, I, I mean... I've been in lessons where the the teacher wants to walk around and see what you're doing from different perspectives to maybe figure out what it is that you could be doing better. And I would think you would lose a lot of that with with a single webcam. Or at least it would take longer. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. Nate, you're you're a string player. Would you would you feel comfortable giving or receiving a lesson, like even over Skype? Where it's where the where it's syn- where it's synchronous, you're at the same time. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that you could do. The to me, the main benefit of this is just the access to the people that you might not have. Yeah. Like if I wanted to study bass with John Patitucci or fiddle with Daryl Anger or or mandolin with Mike Marshall, I'd I'd have to <laughs> do a lot of traveling or live in California to be able to have that kind of access at all. It's true. And, and and we should I should say these people that, that we're talking about getting lessons from, this is not the person that's going to start you on the clarinet. Right. Right. You don't go you know my my 6-year-old thinks it would be fun to play the French horn. Let's find the principal horn player of the Pittsburgh Orchestra, right? That doesn't make any sense. Um so one would assume that a lot of those technical issues that are are particularly important to see firsthand would be solved by the time a person is trying to get lessons from somebody at this how, of this stature. And how big are the studios? What about what about tone quality? So that's that's a tricky that thing. Yeah. I would think tone mm-hmm. quality again, maybe one of those things that you would have to figure out before you're getting lessons. I I mean <laughs> when I'm talk when I'm thinking about getting lessons from people at the, at this level of the music world, I I'm thinking about issues of interpretation that you would be discussing with them. Well, um, see, but that's even- what I was thinking this would be useful for is it's 300 bucks for three months. So if somebody was going to go off on a bunch of orchestral auditions, like a a invented doctoral student, play all your excerpts for that person, I think that would be a great, because they're going to assume that you sound pretty good on the clarinet, and it's all about how this excerpt goes, and they'll have a perspective on not only how it should go, but what people expect from it. Now you're talking. Yeah. That sounds like a great use of this. Yeah, three hundred bucks for three months of that. I think that would be worth it if that's what I was trying to do. You know, you know, it's, and especially if you're graduating from like Portland State, and there's not a, a big time orchestra that's that's really nearby. Um, right. You know, when when you you can you can play your instrument pretty well, but you can't you don't have access to um, you know David Bilger uh, in the Philadelphia Orchestra in Portland, Oregon. Well, so, also, I'm wondering. How much time David Bilger of the Philadelphia Orchestra is going to give to teaching students over this thing? Like a handful? I I and, don't know. I and, and if so, there's got to be there, a cap. Well, yeah. that's what I'm saying. You know, 
<laughs> they're not obviously they don't have time to do this all the time. Like I bet for in person lessons, Ricardo Morales probably charges like three hundred and fifty dollars or something, or yeah. fifteen hundred dollars or something just completely ridiculous. So who can say we should move on? We got a lot of stuff to cover. Do it. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> okay, the big thing. Alan Cozen, longtime classical music uh, uh, reviewer for uh, New, New York, York Times, Times, has been take. He's gotten what I called a lateral promotion to a general culture reporter. He's and, he's uh, got he's getting the shaft is what's happening. He's getting the shaft, and there's Big speculation and, and things flying around about why this might be. And I don't know enough about it to have an opinion, but. Um, I know that there are a lot of people out there who feel very strongly. There's been a petition that immediately, like the day, uh, what was it, Norman Lebrecht? Uh, yeah, broke and, and, and Norman Lebrecht, you know, take your personal feelings aside. He broke this story, and he knows a lot of the people involved personally. Right. So there's a, there was a petition circulating so, later today, I think. It's so gossipy, that, that article. Which one? It's a very inside baseball story, which is why I don't want to talk about it a whole lot, especially since we don't know about it. But it's it's an important thing because not only is is Cozen um, a fantastic writer and a, a, a brilliant observer of classical music, he was also, in a lot of ways, the new music specialist in the, in in the music critic department in, in at the Times, um, and. I don't. Who, staff, who knows yeah. what he's going to be writing after this? Um, but I think we in the new music community are really going to miss his voice, especially for those of us that are outside of New York City. People like Patrick uh, get to see these things firsthand, but people like me and Sam and Nate and Philip just get to read about them. Right. So, Patrick, I was wondering, you know, is this in the office? There's an this opening. Been- Oh, has everybody had jazz hands over this all week? No, it's not like it's just something that that happened. And to tell you the truth, I don't really have like this big load of information to to give everyone. It's, well, you're what? fired. <laughs> That's why we sent you to I, New York so you could be the New York correspondent. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's, this is it's an internal thing, you know, and you know whatever it is, it is. But mm-hmm. I. I honestly haven't spoken to anybody at the Times about this or anything like that. So right, and and again, we don't want to get into any specifics, um, but it, we're certainly going to miss uh, reading Alan Cousin's uh, uh, reviews of, of of particularly new music concerts in New York. Right. And he is, um, by the way, the is that all right, Sam? Yeah, Sa- Sam's playing a little pe- a little bit of music for us. What? What's that, Sam? <laughs> Sam, what do you got there? Is that some kind of magic music making box thing in your it, hand? <laughs> it is. It's uh to celebrate sorry, Patrick, I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought I thought I was feeling you there to, to transition. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Um in celebration of John Cage's centennial, which has been, you know, if you're following stuff online, there are a, a huge amount of things going on, concerts all over the country, of course. Uh, but one cool thing on the official John Cage uh, site that I found this morning is a uh, iPhone and uh, Android platform and tablets uh, John Cage prepared piano app, and mm-hmm. it's pretty freaking cool. That is that all you got? <laughs> <laughs> I found this app here. and it's cool. That's the end of your story. You gotta play four thirty three. Uh, with with this, I'm staring, yeah, and then yeah, I turn, yeah, right. I close the app, that. and then I open it back up. No, it's it's really cool. I mean, the, and the sounds sound like they're well recorded. I mean, I'm playing it from my speaker on my phone into my microphone. Um, yeah, but you know, I could imagine if this were running through a system, it would sound pretty much like a piano being jangled in whatever way. Yeah, and and certainly there were a lot of ways that people chose to observe the the cage centennial and that was that was one of maybe maybe one of the more fun ones um i hate to go too crazy bananas about a centennial because there's i mean it's enough he's, he's got a birthday every year this one happens to have two zeros and fyi it's conlon nancaro's well, class, centennial class, year too. it is yes. oh i just saw that oh, too. man That's we should awesome. we should have done i would much rather do something for nancaro <laughs> 
They're both fun, though. They're they're both worthy of remembering. But it seems like really superficial. Well, to classical say, music loves numbers. Ah, uh, yeah. Somebody, like uh, I was just reading who who had had like a list of uh, ways to understand Cage. Oh uh, no! It's o- Overgrown Path blog had a list of um, the people that would be getting their their centennial celebrations next year. Wagner, Verdi, and Britain all getting their centennial celebrations next year. Yeah, we're gonna uh, have to this be year's centennial. Mahler, event. Cage, and Nancaro. Um, well, I think Cage's is worth celebrating because as far are, as American composers, you have no, no no one else has as much general cultural penetration you know what i, I mean? would never say that these people aren't worth celebrating i'm saying like a hundred whatever brr, it ends in two zeros let's have a party like have a party anytime it doesn't matter when cage is yeah. cool you should have a cage party whenever you feel like having a cage party this you is, should have a Mahler party case. whenever you feel like having a Mahler party and you should listen to peter grimes whenever the hell you feel like it yeah. that's what i'm saying humanity decided Mic to use drop. a lot we decided to use a mod 10 system. That's why we're celebrating Cage right now this year. That's right. <laughs> you have it. Good but story. Out. The, the, the benefit is that a lot of concerts have been going on where you get to hear lots of different Cage pieces performed that you might not hear on a pretty, any, you know, any kind of a frequent basis. Philip, did you do anything to celebrate the Cage Centennial? Myself? Anybody. No, Philip. I was asking Philip, but. Philip, did you do anything? Uh. Not particularly. No, I wrote some. I wrote some mesostics, which you can read on my blog. Yes, Dave wrote wrote some nice mesostics, and uh, I found this morning. And and you're often disappointed in what it comes up with, but they sometimes are cool. There's a mesostics generator, where you enter the the text you want to be mesosticized, and uh, and then the website you want it to draw the content from, and it'll generate one for you automatically. So it's pretty fun. Well, anyway, we're we're gonna have links to tons of stories about the Cage Centennial, um, but he would be a hundred if he were alive. That's, That's <laughs> the story. Are we moving alive. on? Let's do it. So I want to make it clear that we should take uh, full responsibility for the stories that are coming up next. We thanks should. To us, yes, thanks to us, and thanks for us foolishly reporting that there was good news in the orchestral orchestral world recently. <laughs> Murphy and his damn law have come down on us, and it seems like uh, you know things are on fire in the orchestral world. All yeah, of it seems like seems like every day I get up and I read Adaptation. That's the first thing I do every morning, and just read Adaptation dot com <laughs> over my coffee and crumpets. Um, right. Is it, it, there have been all kinds of bad things going on, bad juju in the orchestra world. Uh, there's been bad juju in, in Minnesota lately. Uh, to, this week we particularly have, have read several stories, and some of this goes back actually a little bit earlier. It was a little quick roundup. Um, the Indianapolis Symphony has proposed some pretty steep cuts, uh, austerity measures for their musicians, um, and I think this is in the middle of a contract, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, if I'm mistaken, I apologize. I um, will correct it. Um, Moving but, from a 52 week to a 38 week season. Yeah, some some it's big big cuts. 87 to 63 musicians, um, and a this is a 41 and a half percent decrease in annual salary. That that's not like a little compromise. That is a pull out the machete and get to work kind of cut. Yeah. So there are some 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 big cuts proposed it, with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. Um, the San Antonio Symphony musicians are filing charges with the National Labor Relations Board against the San Antonio Symphony Orchestra for uh, the organization. So this is one of the confusing things about reading about relations is that the orchestra is the the company or the nonprofit company that's that's managing everything and then there's the musicians which are kind of also the orchestra which are like the actual orchestra <laughs> um so anyway the the musicians of the san antonio symphony are uh filing charges against the uh san antonio symphony organization over uh, uh 
bad uh bad faith dealings uh i believe so you should you should read all about all of these things at uh adaptation and last of course this is probably the most consequential to those of us who are into new sounds uh the atlanta symphony is locked out so this is robert spano's organization in atlanta that has uh become so well known over the last decade or so for um not only live performances, but a lot of great recordings of new re, of new music. Young young composers, in particular, uh, have formed. Kind of, sometimes you read about the the Atlanta School, uh, which I've also heard described as the new nice, uh, because a lot of it is is relatively accessible. Um, but a lot of cool music has come out of Atlanta, but it's not going to be coming out of it anytime soon, uh, because the Atlanta symphony is locked out again. Well, to be clear, the lockout is the one that comes from management and the strike, obviously the other direction. Well, hopefully they'll resolve that soon because the Atlanta symphony is supposed to come to Carnegie hall in October. Mm-hmm. Well, so, perhaps, perhaps like- they can, perhaps they can celebrate, their uh, reconciliation by performing for you personally in Carnegie Hall. Sounds this good? one sounds like it has a lot of potential to become pretty nasty. Like there, there's something I mean, about there's, other. I mean, there's anytime there's a, a work stoppage, I think it's pretty nasty. We've we've gotten yeah. to the point of it being pretty nasty. And this one is close to my heart because my lovely wife, when when we were according, our first date, our first official date was Mahler Nine in Atlanta with no break. So. I'll always associate my first date with my wife as needing to pee really bad. <laughs> but it was a great performance. Great performance. So we hope to see the Atlanta Symphony back. Mm-hmm. Speaking yes. of Mahler, one thing that's not on here, uh, the I believe it's the Los Angeles Philharmonic is releasing a DVD and Blu-ray and something else of uh, the Dudamel thing in Caracas where they did the Symphony of a Thousand with a Thousand. Uh, in nice. Caracas, and they they shot it all in HD, and you can buy a DVD of it for probably like sixty dollars. Great. So yep. that's going to be out, I think, in October. They just they just made that announcement this week, I think. Anyway, that was not in the rundown. Uh, other quick news: this one, I think Patrick was the one that told us about Han Bin. What's the story with Han Bin? I know, I know, you guys are homeboys. You guys are homeboys, right? I think that was, that was Sam, Sam or Dave, the artist formerly known as Han Bin. Okay, well, the, yeah. the artist formerly known as Han Bin is no longer known as Han... Well, I guess he could be. Uh, Han Bin, who's a Korean violinist, we've talked about him before on the show. He's very famous for uh, not only his playing, but also his um, persona. He uh, He's has... Marilyn Manson or the Ziggy Stardust of solo violin, depending on how old you are. Sure. <laughs> what, if, what if you're too young for either one of those? Uh, Lady Gaga, Gaga? Madonna. If you're that young, then you look at Han Bin and go, meh, meh. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like the I have no desire to categorize that person who is not in any way shocking to me at all. He does. Like he does him. wild costumes and makeup and hair for his performances. Political statements. So, political a, statements. Well, to go. Yeah. So is this any different than what they uh, in this Limelight article that I linked to you guys? Um, is it any different than Engelbert Humperdinck? I don't know. No, I we don't haven't s- said what his name is yet, though. Okay, oh, so this is okay. the best part. So okay. Han Bin is, uh, I guess, becoming a U.S. citizen, and he gets to apply for citizenship, I, I guess, under whatever name he wants. Uh, and so he is applying for his U.S. citizenship under the name Amadeus Leopold. Amadeus <laughs> that's, like, that's like taking the dorky way of naming your cat after... Uh, classical musicians and making it way worse <laughs> because it's you because and not it's your you. cat good lord <laughs> i can't I, don't, I find i i find it hard to fault this guy because he's just so outside the box and i'm just like whatever that's an excellent point this is by <laughs> far the most normal thing i've ever read about han bin <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, and another we, we applaud his name. creativity, uh, mm-hmm. though I maybe would have picked a different name. Well, it's, it's like naming yourself after someone and his father. That's what he did. Yeah, that's true. Um, this is this is Mozart and Mozart's father. Yeah. Uh, and 
seems you know it almost seems a little pretentious yeah i think he should have gone with milton burt whistle <laughs> <laughs> i don't think he plays yeah. a lot of weird like music burt whistle, doesn't this he? is i think one of the interesting i think this is one of the more interesting things about han bin is that he he does all this weird visual stuff but he plays mozart and beethoven yeah which plays is Brahms. asking for the kind of crowd that's going to have the most problem with him and the way he looks, which is the awesome part about it. No, it's, that's how you get the hipsters. Uh, that's it. That's how you get the hipsters. Uh, he, um, should sit, he should name himself Jerry Dorsey, just to bring it full circle. Have you guys ever written anything that requires, or were, were, you're, were you working with somebody that either does this kind of thing normally or you ask a person to do this kind of thing? With with crazy makeup or crazy hair or you know, really uh, not where I was asking a musician to stuff. do something like that. No, no, I haven't either. No rabbit suits or yeah. marching around. No Stockhausen things. No. Uh, I think he needs to make more more public statements if he really wants to get on this train of. I think he needs to play some more weird music. The Gaga yeah. train. So he's, apparently, he's a weird guy who should be playing weird music. I don't know who put this story in the doc, but I'm reading it now, and it says that Gene Roddenberry is a jerk. Yes. Gene Roddenberry is a jerk. Gene uh, Roddenberry, for those of you who don't know, of course, the creator of Star Trek. Go ahead, Sam. So anyway, this is a first on Sound Notion. It's a Snopes.com story, which I'm very proud that we finally have a Snopes story on the... What is uh, Snopes? I don't know Snopes. Snopes, Snopes is like they... know the real deal. Snopes is named after the Snopes monkey trial. I don't know why. Scope? But, uh, That's not Snopes. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. So that uh, should be on Snopes. <laughs> yeah, <they're, laughs> um, so there was a rumor that there were lyrics to um, the Star Trek theme. And this is basically confirming that that rumor was true, but it tells a story about the guy who actually composed um, the, uh, the actual music. His, na- his name is Alexander Courage. Um, so he uh, composed the theme. They didn't want to pay. Alexander Courage has written a lot of music, or he had written a lot of music for, um, you know, television and uh, ended up being an orchestrator, which I'm going to get to in a second because that's the interesting part. Um, so as a way to, to steal half of the royalties from uh, the composer, Gene Roddenberry composed the lyrics to the the main theme that were never used in the show and only were listed as the lyrics written by Gene Roddenberry for legal reasons so that Gene Roddenberry could... And let me say, first, I'm a Star Trek fan, and I think Gene Roddenberry was a genius in a lot of ways, but he did this just so he could steal half of the royalties from the composer. And uh, mm. I'm, sure, I'm sure on YouTube you can find uh, versions of this being sung with the lyrics beyond... The rim of the starlight. My love is wandering in star flight. I know he'll find a star clustered reaches. Love, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, so, it's such great uh, lyrics too. So you, you should you should include those in your comic book, Philip. <laughs> yeah, right. You'd get sued, I think. <laughs> so you never hear anything about these as far as the television show goes, of course. But it was just a, a ploy for. Uh, Roddenberry to steal half of the royalties from the music because that music is certainly iconic and you can't hear it without immediately thinking Star Trek. Now so the, the moral interest- of the story is beware the lyricist. When you work <laughs> with somebody to write the words to your thing, they own the copyright on half of your stuff and you own the copyright on half of their stuff. It's when you when you write the music and somebody else writes the words, you don't own the music and they own the words. You both own half of the whole thing. Right. Now here's the really interesting part. Um, so, uh, Alexander Courage had a long career as a, you know, kind of what you might think of as a bring your lunchbox to work kind of composer, doing all kinds of work for commercial music and television and films and worked as an orchestrator. And then in the 1990s, he became the lead orchestrator for Jerry Goldsmith, which meant in 1990, uh, or, uh, I don't know what year, it might not what year it was, but Star Trek, the motion picture, when that came out, that means that this guy was orchestrating for Goldsmith the theme that he had originally written for Star Trek. Because Goldsmith used the main tune. Oh. This guy, Alexander Courage, was orchestrating Goldsmith's rendition of his own theme. 
That's like a slap in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he probably made a living orchestrating for Goldsmith in the 90s. I mean, how many movies did he uh, do the the score for? So, anyway, well I thought that was interesting. Speaking of the lyricist owning half of uh, the uh, royalties to a song, award-winning lyricist Hal David dies at 91. Um, this is the obit section of the show. Unfortunately, he was uh, Burt, Burt Bacharach's partner? Big-time partner. And they split after... There was a cool NPR story about this. They... Uh, he said it was amicable, but they just at a certain point stopped working together, but did record a lot of hits with Burt Bacharach. Uh, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head, uh, Butch, uh, the theme from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And, uh, and they, did, they played a big cross-section of Burt Bacharach tunes, and he does like you know stuff you don't hear in popular music now. He does like weird mixed meter things and like taking the eighth note and wrapping it up into three so it has a... You know, a three feel and then coming back out of into straight time and all kinds. And this guy came up with cool lyrics that matched all those sort of off kilter rhythmic things that Bacharach did very, very well. You don't hear that kind of thing going on very much in popular music. So uh, anyway, if you want to do a a, a search on YouTube for some music and use Hal David, you'll be surprised at how many songs you recognize. Tons and tons of songs. Cool. So... We, he will be missed. So our yep. pick of the week this week, Sam, do you want to... <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Uh, our pick <laughs> of the week this week... Is, you got really big in here all of a sudden. Yeah, right. Um, our pick of the week is, of course, uh, from our guest, Philip Bradbury. We're going to check out... Uh, and we would encourage you to check out the work in progress of the way of the sax, which you can find uh, on his website. And Philip, is, is that that's going to be updated as you go along? Yeah, yeah, that's my right now. The website for the comic is just a page on my composing website. And, and we'll of course have a link to that in our show notes, soundnotion.tv/sn. Um, and we're not going to play it right now during the show. I'll probably drop in a little bit of it after, after we wrap up. Um, but you should definitely check it out. What, what, do you have anything you'd like to maybe if for somebody listening to the show, um, set up the, the interactive comic for them before they check it out? Yeah. Uh, you just need. Um, an HTML5 compatible browser like IE9, Firefox, Safari, or uh, Opera, Chrome. or Chrome. Um, and that, that's all you need to do. It just goes to the page, and it'll load automatically. Cool. Um, and and how much of the full story do you have available right now? For the work in progress? Yeah. How much? How much of the work in progress can we experience? Uh, 0.1 percent. <laughs> <laughs> if if what you have there is 0.1 percent, this is a pretty big project. You're not kidding around when you say this thing's growing and growing out of hand. Yeah, the script to the first chapter alone is about 15 pages, and there's like 11 chapters. So. Wow. Wow. So, Dave, are you gonna like play through this? Is that is that how that's gonna happen? There's kind of a, an opening little thing where y- you don't have a ton of controls. Uh, and so I'm just going to drop in maybe 20 or 30 seconds of that at the end. When, when, um, when I get a chance, I'll, uh, update, I'll update a little so I can get the main theme on there at least. And people can listen okay. to that. Great. great. And, then, and then they'll click on it and it'll start the, uh, the actual comment. Great. Well, yeah. uh, Philip, thank you so much for joining us this week. Do you guys have any more questions about the the way of the sax before we wrap it up? Sam, that seems like a great you. project. We lost you, Sam. I was typing, so I had muted my microphone. Um, I'm I work at a saxophone shop, repairing saxophones, and I play saxophone. So I, I'm not inherently a saxophone geek, but I can't kind of can't help it at this point because I see so many saxophones. Have you decided? What kind of saxophone the hero is going to play? <laughs> oh yeah, he plays alto. I don't know. I mean, is there, are there a brand or a model or anything like oh, that? Uh, no, I'd, I'd like to leave that out of it. Out of the. Uh, plays a Yannick Asawa. Yeah. Get no I way. <laughs> I'm not advertising anybody here. I don't want to. Right. Well, uh, if it were me, I would pick something kind of vintage, so you're not insulting anyone anyway. But but it's it's actually. 
very believable to have it well. Maybe, I mean, maybe plays a Rezo Blade sax. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy being Japanese, this is another thing. Vintage, like a Mark VI, some people have probably heard of, but lots of vintage saxophones that go for a lot of money these days. A huge portion of them are being sold in Japan. Uh, saxophone is hasn't suffered from the kind of Kenny Gism of making people think the sax is sort of over and, and being sort of jaded about it. Saxophone and jazz is really popular in Japan, and there's lots of really good saxophonists, and they're buying up all the vintage saxophones. And uh, so they like you'll see them like, and and they're willing to pay is the big thing. So you'll see a, like a '63 Mark VI alto going for like nine thousand dollars to some guy in Japan. So anyway, oh. it's a believable scenario that there be a martial artist jazz saxophonist. <laughs> completely, completely believable. No, that's like I, I, and I know we already said this, but that's my, probably, and it's because it's in such early stages. My favorite part of this is the absurdity of the martial artist saxophone. So, Philip, uh, we're we're definitely going to be uh, glued to your work in progress. Please keep us up to date um, when you when you reach big milestones. Let us know um, because we would love to to share that with our audience. At, at the very least, tweet it out to everyone that follows us on on, on Twitter. Um, but it's it's a very cool project. Do you have any anything besides the way the sax coming up that you want to plug? Um, if you're going to be in Louisiana, uh, specifically North Louisiana in Monroe in the next few months, uh, the ULM One Ensemble it will be performing, uh, The World in My Window on their fall concert. Or so I'm told. It was supposed to happen in the spring, but they fell behind and they couldn't have time enough. There wasn't enough time to rehearse it. All right. And, uh, that's about it. Great. Well, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. It was great talking to you. Thanks. Good to be on the show. Um, that's going to do it for the show. To read more about this this uh, way of the sax project or any of the stories that we talked about, you can find links to all those things. And of course, as always, comment on the show. We again, we really want to try to make this not a one way. Uh, production. We want to have a conversation with everyone. So uh, you can go to our site, soundnotion.tv slash n slash s n, and you can leave us a comment on the episode. You can send us an email using our contact form. You can also, of course, as always, connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. We're at Sound Notion. We're also individually on Twitter. This show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store, so be sure to subscribe there for free. Catch every episode. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo. We are so happy he was able to join us this week. Thank you for being here, Patrick. Thank you for having me. Thanks for working us into your schedule. <laughs> I was if, moving, Dave. Dave, I was moving. You were moving. I, w we give Patrick a, a lot of trouble sometimes, but he was actually <laughs> moving last week. And you can see he's in a completely different white room than he normally is in when he does the show. That's right, Patrick, and you must be exhausted, so you can take the next couple of weeks off if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Sam. <laughs> so thank you very much for writing our theme song, and of course, we always, as, as always, thank Tyler Lab for, for the video. Thanks again to you all at home for watching or listening, and we'll see you next week. Oh, we should plug a guest. Nor I feel like I never plug guests because every time I try to plug a guest, that guest then uh, reschedules, and then I was lying to you the week before. But next week we have—is this still? This is still good. It's on. Pulitzer Prize-winning composer Jennifer Higdon will join the panel next week. So if if you want to join us, then we'll do we'll be doing that live, of course, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, SoundNotion.tv slash live. So if you have any questions for Jennifer Higdon, stop by, drop him in chat. We'll be watching. Uh, or if you, if you can't make it, let us know beforehand, and and we'd be happy to uh, pass your questions to her along. So uh, be back here next week, Pulitzer Prize winning. Did you say did you say Pulitzer or Pulitzer? I say Pulitzer. I, I go I go back and forth. Sometimes you. I think Pulitzer sounds a little snobby. I think Pulitzer sounds a little more hipster, don't you think? I don't know. Anyway, Pulitzer Prize winning composer Jennifer Higdon is back. Thank you so much. This is like the longest wrap up we've ever done. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back next week.